In chapter one of the Tao Te Ching, Lao Tzu writes, truly only he that rids himself forever of desire can see the secret essences, can see the secret essences. Those constantly with desires by this means will see only that which they yearn for and seek. Those constantly with desires by this means will see only that which they yearn for and seek. Is it not true when you want something, you see it before you? And there's, a, there's a, certainly a law of precipitation whereby what we visualize we bring to us. God allows us to have desires and allows us to observe the results of receiving those desires as a means of liberating us from those desires. Because when we want something and we get it, somehow it neutralizes that desire. And God is always hoping that if we get enough things and everything else that we want, we will finally see the futility of this road and desire him only because with all of the things of this world, we will not have God. The frustration and anxiety that comes from inordinate desire is a topic of Thomas Akempis. He gives Christ's instruction on the necessity for the disciple to empty himself of all wrong desire. My son, thou oughtest to give all for all and to be nothing of thyself. Know that the love of thyself doth thee more hurt than anything in the whole world. According to the love and affection which thou bearest toward anything, so doth it more or less cleave to thee. If thy love be pure, simple, and well-ordered, thou shalt be free from the bondage of things. Do not covet that which it is not lawful to have. Do not have that which may entangle thee and deprive thee of inward liberty. Why art thou consumed with vain grief. Why weary thyself with superfluous cares? Be resigned to my good pleasure, and thou shalt suffer no loss. If thou seek this or that, and wouldst be in such or such a place, the better to enjoy thine own profit and pleasure, thou shalt never be at quiet, nor free from anxiety. For in every instance, somewhat will be found wanting, and in every place there will be someone to cross thee. He that attributeth any good unto himself hindereth God's grace from coming unto him, because the grace of the Holy Spirit ever seeketh an humble heart. If thou couldst but perfectly bring thyself to nothing and empty thyself of all created love, then ought I with great grace to overflow into thee, to overflow into thee. As Lao Tzu says, humble station is the basis of honor, the low is the foundation of the high. Remember the words of Liu Ming, if people can be empty within, this is the valley. Within emptiness there is a point of spiritual energy hidden inside. One Buddhist story tells how Gautama, how Gautama addressed the problem of desire for self-importance. This is a wonderful story. The setting is the grotto of the fire god, whose flames were guarded by a group of ascetics. Their leader was one Kasapa, who was esteemed to be the holiest of men and, and who believed he was holier than Gautama. Gautama asked Kasapa if he could spend the night in the grotto where the sacred fire burned. Although Kasapa warned him that the fire god was a great and venomous serpent who could kill him, Gautama still went into the grotto and sat cross-legged in meditation. Whenever the fire god sent forth his flames, Gautama sent forth a greater flame of love and goodwill that quenched the fire god's fire. Despite his surprise, Kasapa still said in his heart, he 
is not holy as I am. During the next days, Gautama performed many tasks for Kasapa. He made a convenient bathing pool, picked fruit, and split 500 pieces of firewood. Kasapa developed an affection for his visitor and said in his heart, this brother is truly most kind and thoughtful, but of course, he is not holy as I am. Marie Biles summarizes the rest of the story as follows. At that time, a heavy rain fell out of season, and the spit of sand with the mango grove, where the master used to meditate, became surrounded by water. Kasapa was afraid that the water still rising would carry his guest away. He, who until now had never known tenderness or concern for another, found his heart heavy within him at the thought that the Blessed One might be drowned. He therefore hastened to the village to procure a boat and take the master in safety to dry land. He rejoiced greatly at the kindness he was able to do, though he still muttered to himself that his guest was not as holy as he. The master, knowing that Kasapa's heart was now softened and pliant and ready for a conversion, said to him, These many weeks, Kasapa, you have been saying to yourself that I am not as holy as you. But can you in solemn truth tell me that you are fully enlightened and know not the meaning of fear? Kasapa hesitated a while. Then his heart was entirely softened by the emanations of the master's loving friendship, and he bowed before him, saying, No, master, I am not fully enlightened. I am still filled with fear. I am not more holy than you. He went into the sacred grotto, and taking the vessels of sacrifice, he threw them into the river, and coming back, he sat at the master's feet and asked him, to tell him of the way whereby he could free himself from fear and find inner sight. Now other of the ascetics of the matted hair, seeing the vessels of sacrifice carried down the river, became afraid lest some misfortune should have befallen their leader. They came hastening to the sacred grotto where they saw Kasapa sitting at the feet of the master and listening to his teaching. And they too, sat down and listened. That fire demon whom you feared, the master said, is within your own hearts. The fire demon of desire, of pride, of self-importance. It is the fire of lust which is burning. When the senses touch sense objects and the thoughts touch thought objects, the fires of lust and desire are kindled. Your ears hear praises of yourself and then your thoughts think of self-importance, and you are fearful lest you lose that self-importance. You forget that this self is not the true self of you, which is universal and deathless. At this point, Kasapa heaved a great sigh of relief. For as the master spoke, a vision of the great peace opened before him. The master continued, Pondering on these things, you become weary of the fires that are kindled by your senses and your thoughts, and then the fires of desire die down. The true sacrifice is the sacrifice of desire. The flame of sacrifice is man's will well tamed, and the true altar is the altar of humility. I would like to read you another Buddhist story that shows how a seemingly tiny desire can grow to such proportions that it can be a man's downfall if it is not caught in time. It tells how Gautama in a previous life as a poor man, felt a desire to be born in royal splendor. Dying, he was conceived again in the womb of the chief queen. He was named Prince Udaya. When he grew up, he became perfect in all sciences. 
At his father's death, he gained the kingdom. One day they made ready for a festival in the city. A great multitude were intent on amusement. A certain water carrier who lived by the gate of Benares had hid a half penny in a brick in a boundary wall. He cohabited with a poor woman who also made her living by carrying water. She said to him, My lord, there is a festival in the town. If you have any money, let us enjoy ourselves. I have, dear. How much? A penny? A half penny. Where is it, she asked. In a brick by the north gate, twelve leagues from here. But have you got anything in hand? I have, she said. How much, he asked. A half penny. So he said, yours and mine together make a whole penny. We'll buy a garland with one part of it, perfume with another, and strong drink with a third. He was delighted to catch the idea suggested by his wife's words. And saying, don't trouble, dear, I will fetch my half penny, he set out. The man was as strong as an elephant. He went more than six leagues, and though it was midday, and he was treading on sand as hot as if it were strewn with coals just off the flame, he was delighted with the desire of gain. And in old yellow clothes with a palm leaf fastened to his ear, he went by the palace court in pursuit of his purpose, singing a song. King Udaya stood at an open window, and seeing him coming, wondered who he was. The king asked what his business was. He answered, O oh, king, O oh, king, I was living by the south gate with a poor woman. She proposed that she and I should amuse ourselves at the festival and asked if I had anything in hand. I told her I had a treasure stored inside a wall by the north gate. She sent me for it to help us to amuse ourselves. These words of hers never leave my heart, and as I think of them, hot desire burns me. That is my business. The king asked, Then what delights you so much that you disregard wind and sun and sing as you go? O king, I sing to think that when I fetch my treasure, I shall amuse myself along with her. Then my good man, said the king, is your treasure hidden by the north gate a hundred thousand pieces? Oh, no. Then the king asked in succession if it were fifty thousand, forty, thirty, twenty, ten, five, four, three, two gold pieces, one piece, half a piece, a quarter piece, four pence, three, two, one penny. The man said no to all these questions, and then, it is a half penny indeed, O king, that is all my treasure. But I am going in hopes of fetching it and then amusing myself with her. And in that desire and delight, the wind and sun do not annoy me. The king said, My good man, don't go there in such a heat. I will give you a half penny. O oh, king, he answered, I will take you at your word and accept it, but I won't lose the other. I won't give up going there and fetching it too. The king said, my good man, stay here. I'll give you a penny, two pence. Then offering more and more, he went to a crore, a hundred crores, boundless wealth, if the man would stay. A crore is 10 million rupees. But he always answered, O oh, king, I'll take it, but I'll fetch the other too. <laughs> then he was tempted by offers of posts as treasurer and posts of various kinds and the position of viceroy. At last he was offered half the kingdom if he would stay. <laughs> then he consented. The king said to his ministers, Go, have my friend shaved and bathed and adorned and bring him back. They did so. The king divided his kingdom in two and gave him half. But they say that he took the northern half from love of his half penny. <laughs> he was called King Halfpenny. They ruled the kingdom in friendship and harmony. One day they went to the park together. After amusing themselves, King Udaya lay down with his head in King Halfpenny's lap. He fell asleep while the attendants were going here and there, enjoying their amusements. King Halfpenny thought, why should I always have only half the kingdom? 
I will kill him and be sole king. So he drew his sword, but thinking to strike him, remembered that the king had made him, when poor and mean, his partner, and set him in great power, and that the thought which had risen in his mind to kill such a benefactor was a wicked one. So he sheathed the sword, but a second and a third time the same thought rose, feeling that this thought rising again and again would lead him on to the evil deed, he threw the sword on the ground and woke the king. Pardon me, O king, he said, and fell at his feet. Friend, you have done me no wrong, said King Udaya. King Halfpenny answered, I have, O great king, I did such and such a thing. King Udaya said, Then, friend, I pardon you. If you desire it, be sole king, and I will serve under you as viceroy. He answered, O king, I have no need of the kingdom. Such a desire will cause me to be reborn in evil states. The kingdom is yours, take it. I will become an ascetic. I have seen the root of desire. It grows from a man's wish. From henceforth, I will have no such wish. And so in ecstasy, he said, I have seen thy roots desire and a man's own will they lie. I will no more wish for thee, and thou, desire, shalt die. So saying, he declared the law unto a great multitude devoted to desires. Little desire is not enough, and much but brings us pain. Ah, foolish men, be sober, friends, if ye would wisdom gain. So declaring the law unto the multitude, he entrusted the realm to King Udaya. Leaving the weeping multitude with tears on their faces, he went to the Himalayas, became an ascetic, and reached perfect insight. I'd like to invite you now to meditate on Lord Gautama Buddha as we sing a song of meditation upon the enlightened one. As you sing this song, you will see on the screen a statue of Gautama Buddha and nature scenes from our Royal Teton Ranch.
The teachings of Jesus and the Christian mystics also reveal how our desires can be the one great obstacle to our oneness with a great Tao. Consider Jesus' parable of the sower. A sower went out to sow his seed, and as he sowed, some fell by the wayside, and it was trodden down, and the fowls of the air devoured it. Some fell upon a rock, and as soon as it was sprung up, it withered away because of lack of moisture. Some fell among thorns, and the thorns sprang up with it and choked it. And other fell on good ground and sprang up and bare fruit an hundredfold. Jesus explained the meaning of this parable to his disciples. The seed is the word of God. Those by the wayside are they that hear. Then cometh the devil and taketh away the word out of their hearts, lest they should believe and be saved. They on the rock are they which, when they hear, receive the word with joy. But these have no root, which for a while believe, and in time of temptation fall away. And that which fell among thorns are they which, when they have heard, go forth and are choked with cares and riches and pleasures of this life, and bring no fruit of perfection. But that on the good ground are they, which in an honest and good heart, having heard the word, keep it and bring forth fruit with patience. Another way to look at this parable is this. The seed that fell by the wayside and was trodden down and devoured by the fowls of the air represents those who have no appreciation for or desire for the word of God. Instead of setting their sights on the kingdom of heaven, their desires and goals are short-sighted. They do not place a value upon desiring God. Therefore, the seed they are given is easily devoured by inordinate desires, the fowls. The only desires the fowls have is to perpetuate their physical existence. So they take the word of God which could nourish both their souls and their bodies, and they use it solely for the nourishing of their physical bodies, and therefore they lose the greatest benefit. The seed that fell upon a rock and withered away because of lack of moisture also represents the non-desire of the word of God. The barrenness of the rock is the barren consciousness that has no moisture of desire. Therefore, it cannot assimilate the word. As Jesus said, the seed that was choked by thorns represents those who are choked with the cares and riches and pleasures of this life and bring forth no fruit to perfection. The seed that fell on good ground and bare fruit an hundredfold are those who have emptied themselves of all desire except the desire for God. Because they have sought nothing outside of God, they are rewarded with the riches of heaven. Jesus rebukes those who desire the things of this world and are satisfied with them. Woe unto you that are rich, for ye have received your consolation. Woe unto you that are full, for ye shall hunger. He speaks of the blessings of ordinate or lawful desire. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Lao Tzu presents a similar set of paradoxes in chapter 22 of the Tao Te Ching. He writes, To be empty is to be full. To be worn out is to be renewed. To have little is to possess. To have plenty is to be perplexed. Therefore, the sage embraces the one and becomes the model of the world. Remember, the one is the child of the Tao. He does not show himself off. Therefore, he is luminous. He does not justify himself. Therefore, he becomes prominent. He does not boast of himself. Therefore, he is given credit. He does not brag. Therefore, he can endure for long. 
Jesus also makes the point that it is hard for those who are attached to their riches to truly seek and find God. Jesus is speaking of material wealth, but you can also think of riches as desires and preoccupations. Take the story of the rich young ruler, and behold, one came and said unto Jesus, Good master, what good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life? And he said to him, Why callest thou me good? There is none good but one, that is God. He settled that point before he even answered his question. But if thou wilt enter into life, keep the commandments. He saith unto him, which, Jesus said, thou shalt do no murder, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness, honor thy father and thy mother, and thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. The young man saith unto him, all these things have I kept from my youth up. What lack I yet? Jesus said unto him, if thou wilt be perfect, Go and sell that thou hast, and give to the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven. And come and follow me. But when the young man heard that saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. Then said Jesus unto his disciples, Verily I say unto you, that a rich man shall hardly enter the kingdom of heaven. And again I say unto you, that it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. As Lao Tzu says, of crimes, none is greater than having things that one desires. Of disasters, none is greater than not knowing when one has enough. Of defects, none brings more sorrow than the desire to attain. Therefore, the contentment one has when he knows that he has enough is abiding contentment indeed. To be content with what one has is to be rich. A Tibetan Buddhist text advises, when we desire liberation from the depths of our hearts, we should, through continuous contemplation of the imminence of death, always abide in thoughts and deeds in these four qualities, to be desireless, to be content, to be easily sustained, and to be easily satisfied. To be desireless is to be unattached to all possessions and not to desire many or good things to maintain oneself. Contentment is to be happy with simple things. Continuing with the story of the rich young ruler, when his disciples heard Jesus say, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God, they were exceedingly amazed. And they said, who can be saved? But Jesus said, but Jesus beheld them and said to them, with men this is impossible, but with God all things are possible. Peter answered and said to him, Behold, we have forsaken all and follow thee. What shall we have therefore? Jesus said to them, You which have followed me in the regeneration when the Son of Man shall sit in the throne of his glory, ye shall also sit upon twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. And every one that hath forsaken houses or brethren, or sisters, or father, or mother, or wife, or children, or lands, for my name's sake, shall receive an hundredfold, and shall inherit everlasting life. But many that are first shall be last, and the last shall be first. As Lao Tzu says, humble station is the basis of honor. The low is the foundation of the high. In his book, Seeds of Contemplation, Thomas Merton wrote of the subtle obstacles to becoming completely empty of all wrong desire. 
Thomas Merton was a 20th century American who became a Trappist monk and a priest. He is well known for his writings on the Western and Eastern spiritual paths. In Seeds of Contemplation, he reflects on the inner life of the contemplative and says, measure if you can the sorrow of realizing that you have a nature destined by God for the gift of beatitude, which utterly transcends everything that you are and can ever be, of finding yourself left with nothing but yourself, of finding yourself without the gift, which is the only meaning of your existence. Even without your mistakes and your sins, everything that you are or can be or have or can possess appears to you as if it were nothing because it has no power to procure for you the immense gift which, which is utterly beyond you and which is the only real reason why you were created. But when on top of all that you see that your nature is still twisted and disfigured by selfishness and by the disorder of sin and that you are cramped and warped by a way of living that turns you incessantly back upon your own pleasure and your own interest and that you cannot escape this distortion that you cannot even deserve to escape it by your own power, what will your sorrow be? This is the root of what the saints call compunction. The grief, the anguish of not being able to be what you were meant to be, but being everything that you were not meant to be. As peace settles upon the soul and we accept what we are and what we are not, we begin to realize that this great poverty is our greatest fortune. For when we are stripped of the riches that were not ours and could not possibly endow us with anything but trouble, then we became aware that the whole meaning of our life is a poverty and emptiness which far from being a defeat are really the pledge of all the great supernatural gifts. We become like vessels empty of water that they may be filled with wine. We are like glass cleansed of dust and grime to receive the sun and vanish into its light. Once we begin to find this emptiness, no poverty is poor enough, no emptiness is empty enough, no humility lowers us enough for our desires. Then our greatest sorrow is to find that we still attach importance to ourselves, still can be great in our own eyes. For we have begun to know that any shadow cast upon the transparency of a pure and empty soul is an illusion and an obstacle to the undulterated light of God. And we see that our knowledge is darkness by comparison with light. Our power is supreme weakness and makes us incapable of his strength. And all human desire deceives and disturbs us and turns us away from him. The more our faculties are emptied of their desire and their tension towards created things, and the more they collect themselves into peace and interior silence and reach into the darkness where God is present to their deepest hunger, the more they feel a pure burning impatience to be free and rid of all the last obstacles and attachments that still stand between them and the emptiness that will be capable of being filled with God. The Master El Moria advises us, cease your strutting about to be, to be good humans doing good works, always busying yourself to reinforce your self-image as a good human being. Cease all of this, become zero, that God may become the 100% of being where you are. In the parable of the rich fool, Jesus warns about the dangers of hoarding possessions and putting the things of this world before the treasures of heaven. The Jerusalem Bible reads, a man in a crowd said to Jesus, master, tell my brother to give me a share of our inheritance. My friend, he replied, who appointed me your judge or the arbitrator 
of your claims. Then he said to them, Watch and be on your guard against avarice of any kind. For a man's life is not made secure by what he owns, even when he has more than he needs. Then he told them a parable. There was once a rich man who, having had a good harvest from his land, thought to himself, What am I to do? I have not enough room to store my crops. Then he said, This is what I will do. I will pull down my barns and build bigger ones and store all my grain and my goods in them. And I will say to my soul, My soul, you have plenty of good things laid by for many years to come. Take things easy, eat, drink, have a good time. But God said to him, Fool, this very night that a man will be made for your soul and this hoard of yours, whose will it be then? So it is when a man stores up treasure for himself in place of making himself rich in the sight of God. Then he said to his disciples, This is why I am telling you not to worry about your life and what you are to eat, nor about your body and how you are to clothe it. For life means more than food and the body more than clothing. Think of the ravens. They do not sow or reap. They have no storehouses and no barns. Yet God feeds them, and how much more are you worth than the birds? Can any of you, for all his worrying, add a single cubit to his span of life? If the smallest things, therefore, are outside your control, why worry about the rest? Think of the flowers. They never have to spin or weave. Yet I assure you, not even Solomon in all his regalia was robed like one of these. Now if that is how God clothes the grass in the field which is there today and thrown into the furnace tomorrow, how much more will he look after you, O men of little faith? But you, you must not set your hearts on things to eat and things to drink, nor must you worry. It is the pagans of this world who set their hearts on all these things. Your Father well knows you need them. No, set your hearts on his kingdom, and these other things will be given you as well. In the King James Version, this reads, But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Lao Tzu says the same thing in chapter 7 of the Tao Du Jing. Wing Sit Chan translates it. The sage places himself in the background, but finds himself in the foreground. He puts himself away, and yet he always remains. Is it not because he has no personal interests? This is the reason why his personal interests are fulfilled. Lao Tzu writes in the final chapter of the Tao Te Ching. The sage has no need to hoard. When his own last scrap has been used up on behalf of others, lo, he has more than before. When his own last scrap has been used up, in giving to others, lo, his stock is even greater than before. Saint Therese of Lisieux took to heart Jesus' warning to store up treasures in heaven rather than treasures on earth and to have faith that God will always provide for our needs. In one of her last conversations before her death, Therese was asked what she meant by remaining a little child before God. She replied, It is to recognize our nothingness, to expect everything from God, as a little child expects everything from its father. It is to be disquieted about nothing and not to be set on gaining our living. Even among the poor, they give the child what is necessary. Therese also added, to be little is not attributing to oneself the virtues that one practices and not believing oneself capable of anything, but to recognize that God places this treasure in the hands of his little child to be used when necessary. But it remains always God's treasure. Saint John of the Cross also took to heart Jesus' words, Seek ye first the kingdom of God. 
In his classic, The Ascent of Mount Carmel, John wrote of how to achieve a state of perfection or union with God. This is the same formula that the Taoists, the Buddhists, and the Hindus have all used. The mystics of all centuries and all ages have discovered this sacred formula. As you may know, the main theme of the ascent of Mount Carmel is the mortification of appetites or desires. John writes, in God or in the state of perfection, all appetites cease. The road and ascent to God then necessarily demands a habitual effort to renounce and mortify the appetites. The sooner mortification is achieved, the sooner the soul reaches the top. But until the appetites are eliminated, a person will not arrive, no matter how much virtue he practices. For he will fail to acquire perfect virtue, which lies in keeping the soul empty, naked, and purified of every appetite. God commanded that the altar of the Ark of the Covenant be empty and hollow to remind the soul how void of all things God wishes it if it is to serve as his worthy dwelling. God allows nothing else to dwell together with him. God allows nothing else to dwell together with him. We read consequently in the first book of Kings that when the Philistines put the Ark of the Covenant in a temple with their idol, the idol was hurled to the ground at the dawn of each day and broken in pieces. The only appetite God permits and wants in his dwelling place is the desire for the perfect fulfillment of his law and the carrying of his cross. Scripture does not teach that God ordered anything else to be placed in the ark where the manna was. He only wanted the five books of the law and the rod of Moses signifying the cross to be placed there. A person who has no other goal than the perfect observance of God's law and the carrying of the cross of Christ will be a true ark, and he will bear within himself the real manna, which signifies God, when he possesses perfectly, without anything else, the law and his rod. At the beginning of the ascent of Mount Carmel, John inserted his sketch of Mount Carmel. So, summarizing his teaching. Inside the sketch are instructions for climbing to the summit. They are, in order to reach satisfaction in all, desire its possession in nothing. In order to come to possess all, desire the possession of nothing. In order to arrive at being all, desire to be nothing. In order to come to the knowledge of all, desire the knowledge of nothing. In order to come to the pleasure you have not, you must go by a way in which you enjoy not. In order to come to the knowledge you have not, you must go by a way in which you know not. In order to come to the possession you have not, you must go by a way in which you possess not. In order to come to be what you are not, you must go by a way in which you are not. When you turn towards something, you cease to cast yourself upon the all. For to go from all to the all, you must deny yourself of all in all. When you come to the possession of the all, you must possess it without wanting anything. Because if you desire to have something in all, your treasure in God is not purely your all. In this nakedness, the spirit finds its quietude and rest. For in coveting nothing, nothing raises the spirit up and nothing weighs the spirit down because it is in the center of its humility. When it covets something in this very desire, it is wearied. That is the end of the quote by St. John of the Cross. 
In St. John's sketch of Mount Carmel, he shows a middle path that leads to perfection. To the right and to the left of that path are two roads which he labels the way of the imperfect spirit. Inside the road on the left, he listed these words, goods of heaven, glory, joy, knowledge, consolation, rest. Next to these words, John wrote, the more I desired to possess them, the less I had. Now that I no longer desire them, I have them all without desire. Inside the road on the right, he listed the words, goods of earth, possessions, joy, knowledge, consolation, rest. Next to these words, he wrote, the more I desire to seek them, the less I had. Now that I least desire them, I have them all without desire. And so we remember that Jesus commanded us to seek the kingdom of God first and to seek his righteousness and all these things would be added unto us. This is also Lao Tzu's teaching. The sage places himself in the background but finds himself in the foreground. He puts himself away and yet he always remains. Is it not because he has no personal interests? This is the reason why his personal interests are fulfilled. In the center of his sketch, St. John drew the path of Mount Carmel, the perfect spirit. Inside this path, he inscribed these words, nothing, 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 nothing. And even on the mount, nothing. Nothing, nothing, nothing. Nothing, nothing, nothing. And even on the mount, nothing. This is the way of perfect emptiness and the way of perfect union with God. As St. John wrote in his instructions for reaching the summit, to come to possess all Desire the possession of nothing. To arrive at being all, desire to be nothing. Through these words, we return again to Lao Tzu's instruction for reaching the Tao. To be worn out is to be renewed. To have little is to possess. To be empty is to be full. This concludes our lecture for this evening. Thank you. Thank you everyone.